Okay. So, hi everybody and welcome to the session. Uh, the speaker is Felix Domke and he will be talking on console hacking 2006. Uh, Felix is quite experienced in console hacking, having spoken at the last congresses on the topic as well. And uh, he brought some of the latest hardware as well that uh, he will be playing around with. So enjoy the talk. Ah, yeah. Oh, hello, everybody. I'm Felix Domke. Um, the video is still missing, but that's no problem. Um, I'm going to talk about consoles, video game consoles. And I'm not talking about games, because I think games are mostly boring. So I'm talking about hardware, security, and uh, what we like. So no games, but hardware and tech stuff. Um, ah, yeah. Great. So these are. Okay, um, it's the first time I use Keynote, so sorry a bit. Um, these are the consoles which are called seventh generation. Um, I don't know how they count, but they started, I think, at Pong or something, and now they are in the seventh generation. And it's mostly about the Xbox 360, the PlayStation 3, and the Wii. We have all three consoles there, if you want to see them and never saw them. Uh, I know they are hard to get in Europe and uh, anywhere in the world, at last the PlayStation and the Wii. Um, so, yeah. I first, I'm first going to um, give you some comparison about the three different hardware types. They are, in some facts, quite similar and other facts quite differently. And then I'm going to talk uh, about the possibilities of running own code on the three systems. So. The Xbox 360, it's about uh, one year old now. It came in, it was available since November 2005. <laughs> there you say, see it. It has quite an enormous amount of processing power. Um, it has a stripped down 64 bit power PC core with 3.2 uh, gigahertz clock um, rate and it's not just one core, it, there are three cores, and because they are so stripped down, they need uh, multi-threading, so in fact, yeah, they are not as fast as a G5 at 3.2 gigahertz per core, but I talk about this later. Um, they have 512 megabytes of RAM, which is quite good, and it's designed to provide HDTV pictures, so your new TVs need some content, and you can use an Xbox that's great, because there are, TV is usually not worth watching, so you can plug in your Xbox and play games, so that's great. The manufacturing costs are quite enormous, because um, a gamer wouldn't pay, well, Microsoft thought a gamer wouldn't pay 500 to $700 for a video game system, and so they sell it at a um, smaller price. Um, I think the core system retails to about 300 euro at the moment or something. Microsoft makes a loss for the video game console, but tries to get the money from the games and so on. It's yeah, their calculation. Why not? The PlayStation 3 is quite similar in processing power through a bit differently. They have the cell processor. I think everybody of you heard about the cell processor. It has been in the media for quite a long time. Now the PlayStation 3 is finally available. And it has one core like the Xbox 360, which is uh, clocked again with 3.2 gigahertz. It's again a stripped down PowerPC core. Um, but it doesn't have the other two cores. Instead, it has in total seven so-called SPU. Uh, course. They are some kind of DSP, some vector processor, which is very good at single pr precision, but not good at integer or double precision. But they, Sony thought it's this ideal for games and for physics processing, so they chose this system. The Xbox 360 uses unified memory. The PlayStation 3 divides the memory into graphics and normal RAM. And yeah, the PlayStation 3 has a Blu-ray disk drive. They are very proud of it. The Xbox 360 has a normal DVD-ROM. 
Um, again, it's, you, it can output HDTV, and the, uh, you can also view Blu-ray movies with it. It's, in fact, the cheapest Blu-ray video player available. And it currently costs about 600 euro, uh, 600 dollars. It's not available in Europe, so no euros. In fact, the manufacturing costs are estimated to be about 800 to 1,000 dollars. So Sony, again, makes a loss on this. Let's hope they get it with the games. Then we have the Wii. The Wii was called Revolution as code name from Nintendo. It's based on a 700-bit megahertz power PC. It's a 32-bit processor, not 64. It's based on the 7050, so it's yeah G3 based, but it's improved, so it has a higher performance than a G3. They have 88 megabytes of RAM, and they have a DVD drive, no HD DVD, no Blu-ray, and no HDTV. They are saying the gamer just wants to have fun and not more pixels, so they choose to keep the costs down. Let's, make, let's don't make HDTV. And the estimated manufacturing costs are $150, so they are not making any loss. So is this really the revolution Nintendo speaks about, saving on manufacturing costs? Uh, well, no. The, really real revolution is uh, the Wii remote here. I have s such a device. It's a new kind of controller. In fact, it's a Bluetooth human interface device. So it's quite standard. The, it works as a controller on the device and contains accelerometers. So you can freehand uh, do movements and the Wii can track them. It can also be used as a direct pointing device, so it can measure the relative position on the screen you are pointing to. This is great for games. There's a bowling game, and everybody likes it, it seems. Um, yeah, the nice thing about the Wii remote is it's usable with a computer without further hacking. Well, it's a bit non-standard, but it, there are tools to use the data coming from the Wii remote, and you can control presentations with it, you can control games with it on a PC, and you can have quite a lot of fun just with the Wii remote. It retails for 30 euro and is available, so if you want to have some fun without buying a Wii, buy a Wii remote and play with it. <laughs> the Nintendo Wii is based basically on the Nintendo GameCube. The Nintendo GameCube, the previous console from Nintendo, is not that much differently. In fact, we have a CPU which is about twice as fast, it's clocked a bit faster, it is, has a few internal improvements. Then it has a GPU which is also faster, about twice as fast as again, has some advanced features regarding the textures and something. But it's basically the same, just with today's technology. They have well the same amount of primary RAM, 34 megabytes. Um, they use a special RAM which is super fast and they like it. They don't use slow GDDR3 RAM or something. They use even faster RAM and they are very proud of it. Um, they have embedded RAM in the GPU. The Xbox 360 has embedded RAM in the GPU, 10 megabytes. The Wii only need three megabytes because it's used as a frame buffer while rendering, and the Wii doesn't do HDTV, so it needs less RAM, so that's okay. They have additional RAM. The GameCube had 16 megabytes. The Wii now has 64 megabytes, which can be used a bit more easier than on the GameCube, but it's generally secondary RAM. The GameCube had a two megabyte boot ROM. The Wii instead has 512 megabytes of flash which is all you, also used for safe games, but for the whole system. And the Wii has a backward compatibility mode. Because it's so easy, they can just switch off features, do everything a bit slower, and then they are a GameCube. So they can execute GameCube games, and it's yeah quite a bit differently. We also had this before, the C64. <laughs> had a less known successor called the C128, and it again had a faster CPU, <laughs> a minimally better GPU, more RAM, more video RAM, and uh, more ROM, yeah. And it had this C64 compatibility mode to run the old software. And 
it didn't do any emulation. That wasn't possible at that time. They really switch off some hardware features, and then they are like an old system. And Nintendo does the same. This is a bit differently than other systems do it. Um, for example, the Sega Master System um, when, was replaced by the Sega Genesis, and the Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive, included the complete old hardware as a sound processor. So if you could, you could use it on the Genesis as a sound processor, or to run the whole Master System games. <laughs> and the PlayStation uh, does the same thing. Um, the PlayStation 2 had the whole play PlayStation 1 on one chip, and the PlayStation 3 now has the PlayStation 2 on one chip. Um, yeah, well, uh, the Xbox 360 has so much processing power that it can emulate the old games with a software emulator. They really uh, emulate I X68 with, um, with yeah, with a PowerPC program and uh, dynamic recompilation and all this stuff, and they achieve a good quality of emulation, but um, yeah, it's a, a big effort for them to, to keep this running and to, yeah, but it works. Now the Wii is just a faster GameCube, except for the Wii Remote. So they can just switch off hardware and be, be, pretend to be a GameCube. Nintendo had this before with the Game Boy Color. It was an improved Game Boy with a color display, a bit faster processor, and they had the same mode. They can't emulate a normal Game Boy by switching off hardware. Well, if you compare the Wii with the PS3 in terms of processing power and so much, um, you think the Wii is, uh, well, not today's technology, but that's quite wrong. Because if we start comparing, for example, the speed, okay, the PS3 has 3.2 gigahertz CPU core, but if you have general purpose um, applications, you cannot really use the uh, um, vector processor at all because you want to do integer work, you want to do branching and so on, and this doesn't work on the SPU. So if you compare just the CPU speed, the PS3 in the benchmark achieved the same speed as a 1.5 gigahertz G5. This is because of the stripped down version of the PowerPC console. The Wii can be estimated at, yeah, well, the half, uh, more or less. There are no real benchmarks on the Wii yet, so it's not quite comparable, but it's about the factor two, the difference between the Wii and the PS3. The price is an increase of uh, 2.54, um, not counting that the PS3 is unavailable in most regions on the world, um, except for a very small region. Um, then the weight is very important if you want to go to a friend and game. The PS3 is a real problem to hold with one hand. Everybody can try this here. It's really not that easy. You need two hands to... It just feels heavy. <laughs> the Wii on the other side, yeah, it's really light and no problem at all. <laughs> Okay, there's another important factor. If you play games all the time, power consumption. So... <laughs> it speaks for itself. If you want the same processing power, uh, you can either buy one PS3 or, well, two or maybe three Vs, and it's sti you still probably pr pay less money for it. You, it's, lighter and you have less, much less power consumption. And not to forget the fun. <laughs> I guess, I really guess, um, I know girls are liking some video games, but I've never seen so much girls liking the Wii. The Wii. They didn't play PS3, they didn't like the Xbox 360, but they really liked the Wii and played all the time. And it's, yeah, it's, it's really a special thing on the Wii. So, the Wii is backward compatible to the GameCube, we said. So, we know there are some hacks on the GameCube. I've presented this two years before. So, is the Wii also compatible with GameCube hacks? It's, in fact, a good question. So, we put together a GC hack compatibility chart. <laughs> Um, on the GameCube, there was a game called Fantasy Star Online. It was an online game, and there was an uh, a security hole in it, which you could exploit to execute own code. This was used 
on, for, by GameCube hackers for many, many months until better methods came. And yeah, it doesn't work on the Wii because the Wii is missing the optional uh, LAN adapter. So it has integrate, uh, integrated uh, VLAN, but it's not compatible to the GameCube um, network adapter, which you had to plug under the GameCube, and there is nothing to plug. So no online functionality in this game and no exploit. Yeah, that's true. There's a USB LAN adapter for the um, Wii, but it's not compatible to the GameCube mode. So GameCube games using, they, they need special, they, on the GameCube there are no libraries or something. Every game has its own libraries. So if you can't change anything in the system, because you can't change the game's libraries. It's differently than on the Xbox. So it's not compatible. There's the action replay hack on the GameCube. The action replay, I'm coming to that, uh, is used to cheat in games. If you are bad at playing games, you can buy the action replay and have infinite lives and so on. It can also be used for better things, and it was used on the GameCube for hacking, and we will see if this still works. On the GameCube, there was finally a boot ROM hack, so you can replace the boot ROM where the GameCube booted from. Uh, this doesn't work on the Wii because even in GameCube mode, it doesn't boot from a ROM, but from a much complicated system, so it doesn't work this way. And finally, some DVD drive hacks appeared on the GameCube, which allowed to run self-written disks with own code. Of course, no piracy, only code, of course. We are not using pirated games. So um, let's see if this might work again. The action replay uh, used an original disc. OK, the action replay is not from Nintendo. It's a third party product, not licensed by Nintendo. But the company making the action replay, Dartle, knows how to make GameCube discs. They reversed it, and they are very good at this. And they are so far the only ones who reversed how to boot discs, which boot on the fly in a GameCube without any hardware modifications or so. So they produced a disc with pretended to be an original disc, and it works in the GameCube. It gets the, the GameCube loads the action replay, then the action replay reads in some cheats, either from memory card, or you can enter them with a controller or a keyboard, and you have to type, uh, you, you have, these codes are published in the internet, so you can type them in and uh, enjoy new games with the new cheats. The action replay then lets you swap, swap the disc and loads the game, which you want to, to hack, uh, to cheat. So it then applies the cheats. The cheats are more or less write to memory instructions. It patches the game. It patches when you die, you lose a life. It patches that you don't lose a life. And then it runs the game. Now, hackers uh, thought that they don't have anything to do with playing, so they wanted a SD bootstrap code from, to boot own code from a SD memory card. So they an SD memory card can be plugged in the GameCube with a small adapter. Um, so they wrote a cheat to boot from SD card. The action replay then was forced to, to yeah, well, to cheat a game. Um, they used the action replay itself, so the action replay, uh, you don't have to swap the disk, that's all. Um, the action replay then applies the patches, and this time it doesn't it, um, apply any cheats, but injects the secure digital loader code into the game, overwriting the original game. Then it tries to run the game. Of course, it then runs the SD bootloader, and you can load from SD card. That's nothing new, but it works on Wii, because the Wii doesn't detect that it's not an, a real GameCube game, so it boots the action replay, but it boots in GameCube mode. So yes, you can execute with code with this, homebrew code, but only in the GameCube compatibility mode, with the switch down capabilities. Maybe it's possible to exit this GameCube mode with some undocumented register rights or anything, and um, this hasn't been discovered yet, but it's maybe a possibility, we don't know. So um, the second thing is the, to hack the DVD drive. Um, DVD security is made to prevent you from copying discs, from burning games on CDs or DVDs, which then just run. This is to prevent piracy, of course. Um, the theory is that, yeah, well, we are wanting, or Nintendo wants to make it impossible to duplicate discs. So um, what they are using is to, they, um, they are using variations in the production. So in every run of a master in production, some parameters are different, and they are not you are not able to choose 
from the beginning how they come out, the parameters. So you can only measure them at the end of the production run. So what they are doing, they are produ producing their disks with their variations. Then they measure the variations. One example is to measure the, the um, angular distance between the first and the last sector. If you write mu uh, a DVD multiple times, the rotating speed differences sum up, and you have a difference between uh, each time on the last sector, where, uh, where which angel it is regarding to the first sector. That's one simple possibility. So you have to measure them, you have to sign them, you have to encrypt them asymmetrically, and store them on the disk afterwards. So now the drive measures this parameter again and compares it if it matches the stored data. Now when you try to burn your own game, you cannot, well, you cannot match the original disk because it's not possible to, to keep the rotating speed, for example, the same. And you cannot change the measured data because it's encrypted with a private key which is only available at the production site. And the drive only has the public key, so it can only verify it but not create the measurement data. Well, on GameCube, they implemented this. They made it, tried to make it impossible to duplicate the disk. They used the variation in production a bit differently than I explained. They measured them, they encrypt them, they put them on disk, and they verify the data with stored data. But they made a mistake. They <laughs> encrypted it <in> symmetrically <laughs> with the key stored in the DVD drive's firmware. <laughs> so this is, yeah, well done. In fact, the algorithm which they used is really, really bad. Um, it's a custom algorithm. It's not even cryptographically secure or something. It's, it's, I, I won't comment on this. So um, maybe they wanted to make things a bit, a bit better, so they added a bit of incompatibility to normal, so the normal disk structure, um, some security or obscurity, and we all know that this doesn't work, but they don't know, so they did it. Not really hard to... to um, defeat, but yeah, they thought it's a good thing. But that's not the only problem with the DVD ROM on the GameCube. The host and the DVD ROM they talk to each other using a drive interface um, co comparable to a tarp or something. The DVD ROM has a ROM and a RAM and the security in place, and it has two additional items. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, I don't know if they are really backdoors or debug comments, but um, they look like backdoors for me, <laughs> especially because the DVD firmware has security stuff, so they should not implement debug commands. And they have a UTS serial port. It's not used. Um, it's a so-called undocumented top secret serial port. We called it so. So, the backdoor one um, basically worked by uh, issuing a special command on the drive interface. You had to issue a password. So it was password protected, the backdoor. And the password was Machita DVD game. <laughs> and this password can, in fact, be found with a simple timing attack. You just uh, try all comments and see that some comments which are uh, returned as non implemented take a bit longer to execute. So if you then brute force each byte, and every time it takes a bit longer to execute, the mem compare took a byte more to compare. And so you can, byte for byte, reconstruct the password. <laughs> so this allows dumping the firmware and uh, read write in the drive RAM. and. Um, yeah, the host, if you want to exploit this, you need some code running on the host using the actual replay hack or ROM replacement and tell the DVD to disable authentication and just accept any standard DVD ROM. Uh, you have to undo this incompatibility stuff, but that's also not much. And um, this was, yeah, when this was found out, uh, mod chips appeared. If the f I call them first generation mod chips. They, yeah, were quite complicated, but they worked. Um, the backdoor 2, as I said, uses the serial port. Um, you can again read write RAM and you can basically make the same attack. But you don't need code running on the GameCube. You can you add a small microcontroller to tell the DVD ROM that it already has done authentication and it should not do this again and so on. 
So a second generation of mod chips appeared, which were much cheaper, and yeah, well, they allowed running piracy, and I didn't think Nintendo wanted that, but okay. So this is the main board of the DVD-ROM, and this is the part where you actually have to, where the serial part is. <laughs> so... <laughs> I'm really not sure if they are so much interested in security. <laughs> Bec now, on the Wii, they fixed it. Yeah, they fixed the backdoor eins. They really fixed it uh, by changing the passport. <laughs> and... <laughs> And they made it really complicated to guess the new password. They changed the old password to lowercase, and it was all. <laughs> okay, but there's still the backdoor too, which might be more important because cheap mod chips are more a problem than expensive mod chips. The backdoor two has been also fixed um, by removing the old connector and inserting a new connector. <laughs> So is the Wii Hick known? Yeah, well, um, we have the action replay to execute GameCube homebrew code. That's fine. We, have, can, we could use the action replay in the backdoor one with the new password to play GameCube copies. We could use the backdoor two to play GameCube homebrew and G GameCube copies. We could, if, if we use the backdoor two, we can just accept any written disk and we can write our own stuff to it. But we can also could also execute V copies because the security is almost the same from the GameCube and the Wii, the, the DVD security. But we cannot execute V homebrew in, in the uh, Wii mode because on the GameCube it was really easy. The, this content was not encrypted or signed. It was, yeah, it had this special format, but that was nothing serious. Um, on the Wii, so, yeah, we could uh, m replace the original game code with our own code and it would just run, provided the drive accepts our disk, but that can be done. So on but on the Wii, the disk contents are encrypted and signed, so that we can not, yeah, we can run identical copies, but we cannot run our own code yet. But this doesn't mean, of course, that it can't be hacked, but at the moment, this is the state of the Wii. Let's come to the PlayStation 3. It's a bit, bit, bit better there. Sony, yeah, well, they had Linux for the PlayStation 2, and it wasn't that much of a success. But um, for the PlayStation 3, they invented this open platform stuff. So they allow, this is uh, an official Sony site, so it allows a third party system software to be installed on the PlayStation 3. So this is fine. Um, they call it Other OS. They don't name they don't tell you any names or something. Um, yeah, they, other OS, of course, means Linux, nothing more, nothing less. Um, IBM has a complete part of Linux to the cell processor. They are using it in their um, cell blades for servers and so on. So they had this Linux port, and IBM made a port to the PlayStation 3. It does not run on the plain hardware because this would be a security issue on the PlayStation 3. You could, for example, just chain boot to a game or pirated game or something, and they didn't want it that. So they um, used a hypervisor which runs at the bottom, at, as we can see here. So every access has to, be, has to go through the hypervisor. This is quite okay. So working. USB is working, ATP, also the, the Blu-ray drive is working, Bluetooth is working, um, Ethernet is working, they have gigabit Ethernet, and the performance, performance even through the hypervisor is not that bad. So they are, um, yeah, it's quite comparable to a slow PC with gigabit Ethernet. So it's quite okay, it's not perfect, but okay. They allow you access um, a hard disk partition, you can reformat the hard disk drive and um, create two partitions, one for the gaming and one for the other OS, um, but they don't allow you to access the gaming partition. And they allow you to access the frame buffer and audio. 
And the good thing is they also allow you access to the SPUs to the vector processors, which makes it very interesting if you really have vector stuff to calculate, because the SPUs run at full speed. They don't have a hypervisor or something. You, if you really want to use the SPUs, the, the PS3 is the cheapest development hardware for the cell. I think the cell blade retails at $19,000 the last time I've, I've looked. Um, so if you have some fun with vector processing, a P3 might be the, the ideal target. However, not working is access to the rest of the hard disk. Um, the seventh SPU, they have seven SPUs. In Linux, there are only six SPUs. Maybe, I don't know what they're doing with the last SPU, but maybe they need it. You only have access to half of the RAM because of, um, there is no unified RAM. You can only access the main RAM, not the graphics RAM. You don't have access to 3D video accelerations. This might be a problem, so you cannot really write games. So the conclusion, homebrew is possible on the PS3. Out of the box, no need to hack. You can build a media center, emulators for old systems. You can r run desktop apps, so that's, I think, everything which Xbox Linux users wanted to have. They have wanted to have a media center, well, with or without Linux. They wanted to have emulators and uh, some applications, maybe. And you can all do all this out of the box with the PS3. The hardware, of course, is crippled. You cannot do everything on, on the hardware because of the hypervisor and so on. But it's usable. It's a compromise, and I think it's acceptable compromise. Um, it would be better if you had full access, but Sony doesn't allow this, and they have their reasons. And well, there's in the end a very little motivation for hackers to to hack the system open to ha gain access to the rest of the features because there's so much working. And um, it would be if they done it right, it would be very hard to to hack the hypervisor. So in the end, yeah, it's not. A perfect solution, but it's a much better solution than on the Wii or on the Xbox. So, yeah, thank you, Sony, for this. Uh, thank you, not Sony, for other things. Um, Michael, machen wir das am Schluss? Die, die Präsentation? Was? Machen wir die am Schluss? Uh, yeah, machen wir Schluss. Okay. Uh, we will later show you running Linux on the PS3, if we have some time left, but I think it looks good. On the Xbox 360, there is also a hypervisor. They use the hypervisor to protect uh, the system integrity. So they protect, yeah, they protect not only games from being exploited and running code injected by stack overrides or something. Um, they they do a real good job by um, implementing a security which does not allow a user application to reload code. Self-modifying code is not possible on the 360. Um, so even games cannot, even if you are evil game programmer and uh, doing a 360 game which gets signed by Microsoft because it's a real game and it includes code which tries to reload other homebrew, maybe homebrew or whatever code from the, let's say, media, from network or whatever, you cannot in execute it because the uh, hypervisor controls the MMU and you can have non-execute code pages and, well, you have no way of changing attributes of um, pages. So, yeah, it, they're doing a good job there um, for them. So, for exact details, you can see my last presentation from one year ago. It's basically still true what I said there. Um, there is no real hack yet. And uh, personally, I have to say, this is one of the best security systems I ever saw. So they learned really, really a lot from the Xbox One. Um, I, I don't like this, but it's that way. So um, the Xbox is very interesting because of the hardware, because of the three cores and so on. So it's really a pity that you can't run Linux on there. But yeah, I haven't found a way. So if maybe one of you want <laughs> to help me there. Um, the hypervisor could allow Microsoft um, to, well, they don't trust games. They don't trust games they've signed. So if they don't trust any user code at all, they could as well allow homebrew code running on the Xbox um, because the hypervisor should protect it from doing anything evil. But Microsoft is not allowing this. Instead, they spend a lot of time and a lot of money, I guess, 
and a lot of people on developing XNA Express, as they call it. It's Microsoft's idea of homebrew code. The idea is as the following. You write your games, and not applications, only games, in C Sharp, of course, and they developed a framework which is yeah, worth to see. If you, you can like it or not, but look at if, if you are a game programmer. It's really easy to use, um, and you can, in five minutes, you can um, display your first 3D object on, on screen and control it with a, with a pad, and I think in two hours you can write a small game with ones either on Windows or on the 360. This is what they call the Creators Club or something. You have there a full access to the 3D hardware because you can use Microsoft's optimized libraries for accessing 3D, their 3D system. And um, yeah, it's a, a big difference to the PS3 where you don't have access to any graphic acceleration. Uh, it's not for free, but you have to pay $100 per year. You have to, you have to enter this club or something. And, um, but that's still cheap compared to the XDK license, which is not so easy to get and costs a lot of money. The XDK, you can write real games in whatever language you want, still with the limitations of not being able to modify code and so on. Um, yeah, but it's made for hobby programmers. And in future, they want to distribute games through Microsoft channels, for example, to the Xbox Live Marketplace or something. So you can, for, if you're a shareware game programmer, this might be the ideal system because you can write small games. You, it's easy, you can use a very powerful system, and you can you have a huge audience, um, so they want to become it a YouTube for games. So users push content, users pull content, and the, that's their dream of the future, if it's good or not. Uh, yeah, everybody has to decide on its own. And uh, I have to admit that I have a quite different uh, thinking of this as Michael. Michael, maybe you can explain your point of view. Do you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, so as we uh, put the slides together, I had a very different opinion on XNA Express, so um, I'm going to tell you what I think about it, because Felix likes it a lot, and I really don't. So Microsoft's idea of homebrew code is you have to write the games in proprietary C Sharp, which is their technology. You cannot choose your own language. And so there is also no way to use existing source, existing open source code, for example. You cannot use your C code. You cannot use FFmpeg, diff, uh, Xvid, or all these libraries. Um, also, they, they restrict access to DVD or network. So for example, there's no way to program a media player because that's a political thing. They only want their media play on the system. Also, you have to pay $100 just for doing something with something you own. You own the box. And this marketplace thing um, effectively allows Microsoft to censor what you can publish. And that's all a big media hype with that YouTube for games thing. Um, it's, it's lots of advertisement by... Microsoft, and I don't think uh, many people really want this. What people want is something very, very different. So I see XNAs somewhat like an alibi solution. So they can claim that anyone can now run homebrew code and everyone can develop homebrew code, but in fact they can just sue any mod chipper um, in the future, if there are mod chips in the future, that, that say that they sell mod chips for homebrew purposes. Because then Microsoft can say there, for homebrew purposes, you don't need a mod chip, because you can already do that. So yeah, the last, last slide there, I'll also do the last slide, about the Wii. You cannot do much with the Wii out of the box. It doesn't have a media player. It doesn't really allow homebrew code or anything. It seems to be quite easy to hack. So it's a perfect target for hacking and for homebrew code and for Linux and all that. So you should keep yourself updated on that. For the PlayStation 3, it is crippled, but basically they did a good job and um, opened it. So, well, I, as speaking for the hacker community, I wouldn't really see a need to hack the PlayStation, other than for piracy, of course, but that's nothing that the hacker community should do. 
And the Xbox 360 is crippled, it is closed, and there is more hacking required. So if you're interested in hacking, that's something you should look into. So keep hacking. Das ist okay. Ich mache noch einmal aus, aber das ist okay, ja? Ähm, okay. Kann man mich hören? Ja. Okay. Um, I'm now going to show you how it looks if we run Linux on the PlayStation 3. It's um, nice to see. It's nothing too unusual, but I will just show it. So, let's switch on. Ouch. You're lucky this wasn't the PlayStation. Yeah, if this would be the PlayStation, it would have uh, <laughs> come <laughs> broken, but... Ah, yeah. So, this is the menu of the PlayStation 3. I have to enable the Bluetooth, by the way, controller. So, um, yeah, if you switch on the box, you get this um, menu, but you can, in the system settings, I already installed Linux on it, but it's easy. You just have to burn two or three two CDs and copy something on a memory stick. Um, you can choose the system which should run as default, either the PS3 or the other OS. <laughs> so this is really nice because if you set it to other OS, uh, I will reboot the console now. It's still shutting down. No. Uh, it takes a few seconds, that's okay, I think. Um, the next time you will switch it on, it will run Linux <laughs> and no games. <laughs> so um, I've plugged in a USB keyboard. Uh, it takes some time. It uses uh, Linux as bootloader, by the way, or something similar. I'm so this is actually the bootloader. It can also boot from TFTP, and it doesn't have network at the moment, so we have to wait some seconds. Um, just press enter, and now it, hopefully, yeah, it runs Linux. So, yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> a family. <laughs> yeah, the small penguins resemble the SPUs, um, which are in general purpose, so Linux does not run really on the SPUs. They have a library to run code in the SPU, but they, it doesn't run Linux, the, the kernel or something. Uh, it takes a while. It's a standard Fedora core something for PowerPC. Debian didn't work, otherwise I would have installed Debian. So, um, yeah, I'm evil, so I'm root. And it has an X Windows. <laughs> And um, yeah, the picture quality is really bad because we used Composite and it has HDMI, but um, no, no VGA at the moment. I, I think, yeah, some strange error. So yeah, you have a fully usable X window system now. Um, if I, okay, you had a fully working. <laughs> ah. Um, Wenn mir jetzt jemand sagt, wie man das ohne Maus bedient, kann ich auch was machen. <lacht> ah, thanks. So, um, we can, um, where is the terminal? <lacht> Sorry, I never used. <lacht> hm? That's good. <lacht> so... Yeah, so that's the PS3. It's, in fact, a very cheap um, multiprocessor system. Well, it's not real a multiprocessor system, but you can um, work on it. Uh, in fact, it's only one core and it's symmetrical multi-threading like the, um, how is it called on Pentium PCs? Hyper-threading. Hyper-threading, yeah, right. So, but it's, it's fun and it's nice, yeah. <laughs> okay, I think that's what I wanted to show you. Um, if 
I heard that some people are already thinking about special applications that can be run on the PS3 using the vector processors. And um, I've looked quickly through the internet. If there are already examples, I thought a ray tracer might be the ideal target for this because it can only do single precision and no double precision. So you can't calculate the weather with it. So you, you, it doesn't do integer in the SPU, so you can't brute force something. But you could use it for graphics processing or some signal processing, and I'm really interested in applications for the SPUs. And I doubt it, but I wonder if game programmers really can use six vector units for their games. So they have the graphics chip. It's a separate normal 3D polygon-based graphics chip. I wonder what they use the SPUs for, but it, it's out in just a few months now, so maybe in a year, we know more. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for uh, watching this. Yeah, any questions? Um, da bringt jemand ein Mikrofon, ansonsten, also, kann ich gerade nicht beeinflussen. I'm not sure, but I heard uh, there are already uh, mod chips for the 360 available. Hey. Um, is the, that correct? But, uh, uh, because I wondered if uh, it's possible to use those mod chips for homebrew applications. Yeah, as the question is good, um, there are mod, so-called mod chips for the 360, but they all focus on the DVD drive. They allow um, self-burned DVDs to be played, also, uh, this means piracy, but um, the game contents, the disc contents are signed, so you can't modify anything. It's about the same situation as on the Wii. So, Yes, you can play copied games, but you can't exchange the, the executable or something because they are signed, and if you change something, the signature breaks. So it cannot be used for homebrew. Okay, thank you. Um, here, on the left, on the right from you. Here? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Can you please um, tell a bit about the different region models of the Wii, like the European, Japanese, and the US, uh, on the and Wii? whether on the Wii yeah. and whether there are any um, differences to get started hacking on it, and which model to get? Um, there are. They are region coded. Um, the Action Replay currently does only run on. American systems. This is a problem because normally the action replay hacks around this, but it can't do this on Wii. So if you want to use the action replay, you need an American Wii. But this might change in the future if there are some drive hacks, which also allow self-burned disks, so you can um, burn whatever region you want. Um, and you also have those Wii channels and the shop, which are um, um, region-specific, as far as I know. Um, do you think there's a chance um, to, to switch forward and back between those regions? As, or? Yeah, as soon as I think the boot process get, gets hacked, I think there's a way to um, specify the region you want, but at the moment that's not possible. But I, I don't think it's... If the Wii gets to completely hacked, that's possible to change this. And, and looking at the PCB, it's the same? Or? I think so. The video encoder is normally different. Um, I'm not sure about the Wii. On the GameCube, the video encoder was different. I'm not sure on the Wii. I haven't checked yet. Thanks. Yeah, over here. Team D. Hmm? Yeah? Ah, yeah. So, uh, I've read that uh, Paradox um, released uh, Wii images of the games. Yeah, that's true, but... But they uh, supposedly read it on a PC. Yeah, the hacked DVD drive uh, firmware for the yeah. PC DVD drives, which allow you run uh, reading raw sectors from disk. But couldn't we go the other way around without using the, the back doors you described? Um, you don't really... You can either read them... Um, you can read them on a PC with the hacked firmware, so you don't need the drive from the... No, no, no write them on a the PC. Write them. No, you, um, you, you, you yeah. can, um, if you hack the, DV, the V DVD firmware to accept burned disks, yeah. that is, that's okay. Yeah, okay, okay. Uh, können wir gleich vielleicht noch besprechen. Yeah, yeah. Genau. Okay, I think we're running out of time, oder? At last everybody is leaving, I hope. <laughs> this has to do with the time and not with me. Yeah. 
So, uh, yeah, if there are any further questions, I think we are down there or in, outside or in the hack center. So, 